Good news there. Uh, we're continuing our series of Reveille, a call to rise. The Reveille is a, a wake up call, and we're looking at great passages in the Bible, great awakenings that occurred in the scriptures. And uh, we're going to continue here uh, and, and look at Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. That's a typo there. It should be 29, verse 35. It says, so the service of the, the second part of, of uh, verse 35. So the service of the temple of the Lord was reestablished. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people because it was done so quickly. Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. They had not been able to celebrate it at the regular time because not enough priests had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. The plan seemed right both to the king and to the whole assembly. They decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel from Beersheba to Dan, calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. It had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written. At the king's commands, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and from his officials, which read, People of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, who have, who have escaped the, the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not be like your parents or your fellow Israelites who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so that he made them an object of horror as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Come to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. If you return to the Lord, then your fellow Israelites and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. The couriers went from town to town in Ephraim and Manasseh, as far as Zebulun, but people scorned and ridiculed them. Nevertheless, men from, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered, following the word of the Lord. A very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread in the second month. They removed the altars in Jerusalem and cleared, the way, uh, cleared away the incense altars and threw them in the Kidron Valley. They slaughtered the Passover lamb the 14th day of the second month. The priests and the Levites were ashamed and consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. They, then they took up their regular positions as prescribed in the, the law of Moses, the man of God, the priests flashed the, uh, against the altar the blood handed to them by the Levites. Since many of the crowd had not consecrated themselves, the Levites had to kill the Passover lambs for all those who were not ceremonially clean and could not consecrate their lambs to the Lord. Although most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover contra contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the Lord, who is good, pardon everyone who sets their heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even if they are not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. The Israelites were present in Jerusalem, the Israelites who were present in Jerusalem celebrated the festival of unleavened bread for seven days with great rejoicing. While the Levites and the priests praised the Lord every day with resounding instruments dedicated to the Lord. Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good understanding of the service of the Lord. For the seven days they ate uh, their assigned portion and offered fellowship offering and praised the Lord their God, the God of their ancestors. 
The whole assembly then agreed to celebrate the festival seven more days. So for another seven days, they celebrated joyfully. Hezekiah, king of Judah, provided a thousand bulls and seven thousand sheep and goats for the assembly. And the officials of the priests consecrated themselves. The entire assembly of Judah rejoiced along with the priests and Levites and all who had assembled from Israel, including the foreigners who had come up from uh, Israel and those who resided in Judah. There was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. The priests and Levites stood to bless the people, and God heard them, for their prayer reached the heaven. Reach heaven, which is his holy dwelling place. When all this had ended, the Israelites who were there went out to the towns of Judah, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. They destroyed the high places and the altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh. And after they had destroyed all of them, the Israelites returned to their own towns and to their own property. You know, in chapter 29... Uh, chapter 28 and 29, we see a, a dramatic change. And we looked at this uh, a couple weeks ago, and great reforms were, were made. And then you read it, what we read at the beginning there. It says that they, were, they rejoiced because it had all taken place. Change had happened so quickly. And so here we get to chapter 30, and there's a continual awakening going on in Israel. And this is the key to true revival is you've got to keep good going. You've got to keep good going. They didn't stop the momentum, but the reforms continue to spread from Jerusalem to Judah all the way up into Israel, sweeping changes across uh, Judah and Israel. This was a tremendous awakening, okay? And, and just a little bit of uh, Old Testament history, it says that they that nothing in verse 26 of chapter, 20, uh, chapter 30, nothing like this had happened since the days of Solomon, Okay? That would be like us saying, we celebrated the 4th of July, not since the days of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, okay? Wow. This was 250 years difference. Yeah. Since the days of Solomon, that they had, had not celebrated the way the Lord had required. And it was a great revival. And you ask, you know, what caused this great revival? What, what caused this awakening? What was the alarm? What did they hear? Hezekiah simply invited them to celebrate, to celebrate the Passover. He awoke in celebration. And there is tremendous power in God's people celebrating all that he has done for them. Amen. Amen. You know, this week on Tuesday, I'm going to be 38 years young. Amen. I, I have a birthday this week. And, and so as, uh, you know, the, as you do with your birthday, you, you got to celebrate. you got to have fun. So I decided to, to not be on a diet this weekend. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and, I, and I drank uh, last night. I went to Hop Dottie and I got me a shake. Ooh, salted caramel. Right. And you know what happened in my mind? This is what was going on in my mind. <laughs> A party going on right here. It's time to celebrate. I think far too often we, we, stop, we stop celebrating all that God has done. And this was a grand celebration. It ignited a spontaneous encore of more celebration. They celebrate for seven days and say, hey, we haven't had enough partying. Let's go seven again. Let's do it again. That's amazing. Have you ever celebrated for 14 days straight? That would be awesome. 
I mean, they, they had 8,000 bulls offered, 17,000 sheep and goats. That's 6 million pounds of beef, 2 million pounds of sheep and goats. Talk about a barbecue. Amen. All the Texans said, Amen. You know? That's amazing. They know how to party back in Israel's day. And Hezekiah, his reign was powerful. And just this simple invitation to celebrate. It caused a lot of change, didn't it? In verse 14, on the way, there was a pre-celebration clean out, wasn't there? Because if we're going to worship God, we got to get rid of, we got to clear out all of this idolatry. Oh, yeah. After the celebration in chapter, chapter 31, in verse 1, what did they do? They went back home. Before they got home, they smashed all the idols. And so celebration, it, it sparks a cleaning out. Yeah. Because for these people at this time, it was bleak. As Hezekiah's message in verse 9 says, this is during the time of the divided kingdom. You have Israel in the north. And you have Judah in the south. Hezekiah was king of Judah. The, and then the northern kingdom, uh, a few years before his reign began, was carried off by the king of Assyria. So this was a time of captivity for, for Israel. I mean, this would, you would not think, celebrate, no way. Our wives, our children, our people, our neighbors have been carried off because we've done evil. And now the Lord's punishment is upon us. It was a tough time. You can read about this in, in 2 Kings 17. But Israel forsook God and they worshipped other God. They followed the practices of the nations the Lord drove out. And now they're carried off into exile. So it was hopeless. I mean, we can't even imagine how hopeless you would feel at this point. That an occupying nation would come in and take people back. And other, and other people would move in, and now they're occupying your land and taking taxes from you. I mean, this is a hard time. Yeah. You know, and as I studied this, this idea of celebration and what celebrating all that God has done can awaken and revive in our hearts, it, it really challenged me. I asked questions like, how can a simple call to celebrate cause major reforms? Right. How can celebration stir people in even a hopeless time such as this. I've been reading a book called Chase the Lion by Mark Batterson. And he says, I don't believe our greatest shortcoming is not feeling bad enough about what we've, not, what we've done wrong. I think our greatest shortcoming is not feeling good enough, good about what God has done right. When we under-celebrate, we fall short of the glory of God. One of the commands in Leviticus was a seventh day celebration. When was the last time you celebrated anything for seven days? God challenged the Israelites to celebrate longer, to celebrate better. That's like a command to eat cupcakes. <laughs> and God didn't just mandate week long celebrations. He also commanded a year long honeymoon for newlyweds. <laughs> It's found in Deuteronomy 24. If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. Wow, what a command there. That's another lesson for another day. A whole year of honeymoon. Wow. God calls men to be free from any responsibility except to celebrate their marriage and make his wife happy for the first year. Brothers, God wants you to make your wife happy, amen? You're supposed to make her radiant. And the point is, God wants us to celebrate. God wants us to celebrate. We need to hear Hezekiah's call and awaken celebration. We need to celebrate more, we need to celebrate better. Individually, collectively, this is why we gather, to celebrate all that God has done. Amen. So if you came in here tired this morning, you didn't, maybe you didn't know what you were being invited to. You were being invited to a party. Amen. We're here to celebrate yeah. all that God has done. Amen? Amen. You know, and Hezekiah called them to celebrate the Passover of the Lord. To celebrate the day that God delivered them and their ancestors from destruction. 
And we, as Christians, we get to celebrate the deliverance God provided when we were washed in Christ's blood, right. our Passover lamb, at our baptism. Amen? Amen? When was the last time you stopped and simply celebrated your salvation? Mm. When was the time you just rejoiced in song and said, thank you, Lord, for saving me? When was the last time you, you, you cried just tears of joy thinking about what God has saved you from? Yeah. All the vile and wicked sins and how he's changed your life and the trajectory not only of your life, but of your children and their children. Right. He saved us so much. Do you celebrate the life God has given you? You know, celebration is important to God. Sometimes people say, you know, if I follow God, I won't have any more fun. Right? Oh. right? It's, it's not going to be fun. You know, honestly, people hear that I'm a minister and like, you're a minister. You're kind of fun. How does that work? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and people associate church with boring. Yeah. But they don't understand who God is because God loves celebration. Yeah. You know, probably one of your least favorite books in the Bible, Leviticus. You know, it, it prescribes some celebrations. In chapter 23, I've just summing it up here. These are the appointed festivals. This is in the commands, okay? You're supposed to celebrate the Sabbath one day a week. That's 52 days a year. Mm -hmm. Celebrate the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's seven days a year. You got the First Fruits Feast, one day, Feast of Weeks, Feast of Trumpets, Feast of the Day of Atonement, uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles. That's seven days, okay? That's 70 days of dedicated feasts where you don't do anything. You don't work at all. Okay? 70 days a year. Do you have 70 days of vacation? I mean, that would be nice. This is God's commands. In a boring book, Leviticus. I mean, this is what he commands us to do. 70 days. This is what God's heart wanted. You think about it. Think about our culture here in the U.S. Our culture is known to be stressed out, overworked. But that's not God's plan for his people. In 2015, a study shows that more than half of American workers, 55%, left vacation time unused. Unused vacation time. This added up to 658 million days of unused vacation. And the days that couldn't be rolled over into the next year, if you total the value, that was $61.4 billion lost in benefits annually. What's wrong with us? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Our culture definitely doesn't stop to celebrate God, but we don't stop. Yeah. We don't know how to rest. Yeah. You know, I mean, people work all the time. I mean, can it, the, I don't know if anybody else can relate, but the idea of having your email on your phone and all this different stuff and text messages, and all, you're connected all the time, which in some ways is great, but in other ways it's bad. Because yeah. <coughs> you're never off. Yeah. You never disconnect, and we don't know how to rest. And you think about this, close to 20% of your days commanded by the Lord are to be rest and celebrating who he is wow. and worshiping. 20% of, of a year. You know, it's important for us because we don't often consider time of rest and celebration. We think, oh, I, I'm going to get behind. I'm, I'm already behind. And if I don't work, I... And, and so we don't rest ourselves and then we don't celebrate. And, you know, I'm not talking about just going and being lazy. I'm talking about resting. God wants us to celebrate, amen? And this is not just the God of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. In Luke chapter 10, verse 20, when the 72 come back and they're excited about all they had done. Jesus says, don't rejoice in your accolades. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. 
You know, Acts chapter 2, it describes the church. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added daily, uh, added to their number daily, those who be, who are being saved. Talk about a church culture that's magnetic. Praising God, enjoying the favor in each other's homes, eating, hanging out. That's what it should look like in the church. Amen. That's what they were known for. Yeah. Praising God and enjoying the favor. You know, and celebrations are not just confined to earth. Jesus describes heaven. You know what heaven's going to be in Luke 14? A great banquet. Mm -hmm. A great banquet that God says there's plenty of room. There's never, there's always a vacancy sign here. Heaven's not going to run out of room. And it's described as a great banquet. Amen. And then on in Luke 15, he describes heaven's response. He says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. In verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Rejoicing in heaven. Amen. God likes to celebrate. Right. He, he describes what he does. What do, they, what do they do in heaven? We know they celebrate when we repent. That's amazing. Yeah. And in the climax of the story of the prodigal on down to Luke 15, it says, but the father said to his servants, quick. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. When the son who's wandered and squandered and, and really destroyed his life comes home in a mess. Broken in a mess, doesn't he? comes home, what does the father do? He quickly meets all his needs. He gives him food and clothes, and he calls everyone to what? To celebrate. Get the DJ, fire up the pit. Let's take him shopping. My son was dead. He is alive. We've got to celebrate. Oh, yeah. The older son, he objects. Why are you celebrating a sinner's return? The older brother, you know, and this is God's response. But we had to celebrate. And be glad because this brothers of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. God's response to somebody objecting to the party is, no, no, wait, we had to celebrate. Amen. Celebrating for God is not an option. He celebrates. It's pretty amazing to think about a God who celebrates. Yeah. God likes to party. Yeah. God likes to have fun. Yeah. God wants to have a feast. And invite us there for eternity. That's who God is. Amen? Amen. He celebrates us. Consider this. He, God, he celebrates us. Why do we struggle to celebrate him? He celebrates when we run, return home. Why don't we celebrate his powerful deliverance? It says that every time a sinner, any of us repents, Heaven throws a party. He celebrates every time we, we get back up after we fall. Yeah. Why don't we celebrate his constant faithfulness? Yeah. You know, every time we wander and come back, what does he do? He celebrates. This is the God we serve. Mm -hmm. A God who says, I have to celebrate. Is this what you see God as? Today, I want to call you, wake up and celebrate, amen? amen. God has delivered us. Yeah. God has delivered us. Sometimes we can feel like, well, God hasn't done anything for me lately. Yeah. Have you ever thought that? Yeah. God, why aren't you answering my prayers? I've prayed about this so many times. Look at my prayer journal. Yeah. Come on, God, where are you? I'm here. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. And we lose sight of what God has always done already done you know it's, we can't have this immature attitude I had one like this when I was a young teen mom and dad my sister are here they can attest to this <laughs> one day uh, our parents they took us to Six Flags they took us out to eat 
And later that night, some people were going to go to a movie. And I was invited. And you know what? I wasn't able to go. So I had the audacity to complain. I wanted to go to the movie. The parents said no. And so I complained. I'm so bored. We never do anything. I don't know if anybody else has ever done that. Or your kids have done that. I see my kid, I'm like, what? You know, my dad looked at me. He remained calm. And he said, we never do anything. We just got home from Six Flags. You're sunburned from Six Flags, son. We went out to dinner, neither of which you paid for. We never do anything. In the same way that we've lost sight of what our parents have done for us, we lose sight of what God has done for us. And we under-celebrate. We make him out to be a stingy person. But God is so generous. And he's working in ways that we don't even understand. He's doing things that you can be answering prayers that you haven't even asked yet. He's already answered them. They're already lined up. You don't even know what's going on. We can be so short-sighted of wanting prayers answered so quickly that we lose sight of how generous God has been. Let's not forget to what he's done to bring us to this point in our life. Right. Let's not under-celebrate. I want to awaken celebration, amen? amen? Let's wake up and celebrate. Secondly, what do we celebrate? We just celebrate God. We celebrate God. Amen. You know, in 2 Chronicles 30, verses 6 through 9, the, uh, the letter that he writes to Israel, he equates celebration as with returning to the Lord. He describes the, the God we are celebrating. He says, celebrate a God who when we who will return, when we return, he doesn't turn from us. He says, celebrate a God who turns his fierce anger away. We celebrate a God who is gracious and compassionate. I love this idea that if you come to him, he will not turn his face away. Recently, I was talking to a man. He's going through a horrible time in his life. Bad decisions all over. Rough, difficult things. Nobody in here stopped pointing fingers. In your mind, oh, I know what he's talking about. You don't know. But he's going through such a time. And I sent him this passage as I was studying. It's just the idea that if you turn your face to him, he's not going to look away. Sometimes when we see each other sin, we're like, oh, I don't want to mess with that. But that's not who God is. When we return to him, he does not turn his face away. Amen? Amen. You know, and it's, it's interesting to me that some rejected the invitation. Mm. Why would you reject an invitation to a party? I mean, they killed so many cows. I mean, that's a big barbecue. <laughs> they got plenty of food, bro. Come on. Yep. But in fact, they ridiculed them. It revealed their hard hearts. They were ridiculing the messengers because... They, they, they didn't want to celebrate what God had done. And when we reject God's invitation, it just shows our hard hearts. We, we don't want to celebrate. We, we deny what God has done. But it says those who came did what? Those, they humbled themselves. Humility is an important part of celebrating God. Because without it, you won't celebrate it. Because you think by your own power and by your own goodness, you brought yourself here. And by your own power and your own goodness, you're going to carry yourself tomorrow. But humility says, no, no, I got to praise God. I, I Look at what God did for me, not what I did for myself. You know, there was, a, like I said earlier, there's a pre-celebration removal of idolatry. When you look to God, you've got to remove the idolatry. Why worship something that doesn't work? You cannot celebrate God's powerful deliverance while bowing down to idols. You got to clear the way to celebrate. Right. There's a post celebration destruction of idols. You know when you go and celebrate all that God's done, you got a clean house. You go, man, I can't celebrate. Look at what God did. Yeah. This is the real and true God, not these false things. Yeah. You know, in, in verse three, it describes. Uh, it, just so you guys have a little bit of context, it's a little bit of confusion. You're like, wow, what is he talking about? The right time and all these different things. Uh, you can look in Numbers 9 and, and study out the prescribed times for the, uh, the Passover. It was supposed to be on the first day of, or the 14th day of the first month, but they weren't ready for it then. 
But then in verse 15 of Numbers, or they began the celebration on the 14th day of the second month. Okay, they were a month late, but in the law, if you read Numbers 9, there's a clause given there. If you're traveling or unable, if you're not ceremonially clean, on the first, during the first month, you can celebrate on the 14th of the second month. There's a clause there. Okay? Okay, and so they were within the law. If that's in Numbers uh, 9, 10, and 11. So Hezekiah, he utilized the clause here in the Passover. But then you get to verse 18, and it describes men who ate the Passover meal in an improper way. They were not consecrated prior to eating the Passover. Thus, they disobeyed the law. And it's true. There wasn't a clause for this one. So what does Hezekiah do? He prays for them. He intercedes for them. And this is a great prayer that I think we've got to learn and pray for ourselves and for others. Uh, let's look at this prayer. It says, may the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets their heart on seeking God. Even if they're not clean according to the rules. What a great prayer. Yeah. Yeah. May the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets their heart on seeking God. Yeah. And it says in, that the Lord heard and healed them. Yeah. You know, this is a prayer that I pray often. May the, may, even if you're not according to the rules, that God, who is the God of all mercy, would pardon. Yeah. And so what can we learn from this? When you read all this, you're like, Old Testament law, and I don't really understand. What are we, what are we celebrating here? We're celebrating a God who pardons. Yeah, yeah. That's who we celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Because no one is ever going to meet every biblical requirement. Right, yeah. No one, is, as James was sharing earlier, we're sinful. Yeah. We're sinful, but we're loved more than we can understand because we're loved by a God who pardons. Yeah. Doesn't mean we should obey the law and ignore, you know, this was a special case here. Hezekiah prayed for them. Yes, we need to obey the law. Right. You got to obey what you know, but we celebrate. Who are you worshiping today? Who do you pray? Why do you go and read your Bible and pray? What are you, who are you aiming for to connect with? Yeah. Some of us walk into our Bible study and throughout our life, we're so guilty. Oh, I didn't do this right. I I didn't pray 30 minutes today. I, I, I'm sinful. You know what I mean? And we walk so guilty and so downtrodden. Instead, we got to look at, we're praising to a God who pardons. Amen. Who pardons. Even if we didn't follow all the rules. Yeah. Because no one is going to follow all the rules. Right. We need God's mercy. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That's who I'm celebrating today. As I read the scripture and studied it, I'm celebrating a God who pardons. That's why I'm singing, because surely I have not kept all the rules. And I know you haven't either. So let's come together. Let's celebrate a God who pardons. He's done so much in our past, and he will pardon our futures. Amen. It's so amazing. Amen. When God shows himself to Moses, he says, how, how does he introduce himself in, in Exodus 34? The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's how God introduced himself to Moses. Is this who you praise this morning? Is this what you're celebrating? A God who pardons. Look over in Psalm 136 as we close. I'm going to give you a little bit of homework today, okay? okay it's not beyond your reach. You can do this one. It's not as hard as that mechanical engineering homework, David. So you can, you can do this one. Psalm 136. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. And as you read through the rest of the psalm, the, the psalmist, it just chronicles all these things from creation to all throughout Israel, all these great moments 
that God has delivered them. All the great things that God has done. You know, from creation to the Red Sea to the kings they conquered in the promised land. And so the homework for all of us is I want you to write Psalm 136 extended edition. You know, Gloria edition. You know, and you will just see all the different things. Write down, okay, and sit back and think, what has God done? In what season of your life did God call you? And you remember that time and you write it down. And you got half of the sentence already written. The God who, dot, 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 you fill in your story. And then the rest, his love endures forever. And then you come to the next phase of your life. His love endures forever. Imagine one day sitting with your grandkids. And you open up the story of your life. And that's what these psalms were. They were the story of Israel. They were songs so that the, the people would know the history. And imagine telling your story. I was at Texas A&M. And somebody met me on a bus. And he started studying the Bible with me. And then one day I, I went on a retreat. And I met this blonde-headed sister. His love endures forever. And then I, I got married at a park. His love endures forever. And I got a great job and I got a beautiful son. His love endures forever. That's Marcelo's story right there. It's pretty amazing. And you know, the thing is, we all have such a story. Times we prayed for things that God did. Times we, we didn't even know we should be praying and things happened. Story after story, what would your Psalm 136 look like? Because we have such a reason to celebrate, amen? amen? Because God has intervened. He has done so many wonderful things. So today, I, I want to awaken celebration, just like Hezekiah did. They celebrated the Passover. We get to celebrate our relationship with God. We get to celebrate all that Jesus has done with us. I want to invite you. Start celebrating. Yeah. Take your walk with God needs to be a celebration. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and truly, God is worthy of celebration. Let's celebrate God. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.